My name is Heather Landman, and uh, I am going to talk to you today about kitchen chemistry. Um, my background is that I uh, did uh, my bachelor's degree in chemistry, and now I'm studying with Amanda at uh, Columbia Earth and Environmental Engineering Department. So, yeah, hopefully that'll work out. <laughs> um, okay, so why do we cry over onions, and why do we need to knead dough? So starting with the chemistry of dough kneading, um, going over the basic process, probably, okay, I think probably most of you, 95% of you would say, are uh, familiar with this. So you start out usually with dry active yeast because it's easier to get than fresh yeast. And then you dissolve it in water. And then you mix it with some other stuff, like flour. And then you get your hands dirty. And then you knead it. That's the important part that we're focusing on. And then it rises, and then you bake it. I guess I didn't have to go through these piecemeal. <laughs> um, and then the, the final bread looks like this, and it's got all these holes and everything. So where do they come from? Um, the basic process is called fermentation. Uh, it's the same thing that makes beer. Um, basically taking glucose and using enzymes from yeast to make ethanol, which evaporates during the baking process and carbon dioxide, which is the gas that will enable the bread to rise. So <clears throat> here are some uh, individual yeast cells. And once they're dissolved in the dough, they're going to make uh, become little powerhouses for carbon dioxide. So the carbon dioxide is trapped in bubbles. And um, as the gas expands, the, the dough will expand. So at the end of mixing, you have small bubbles like this. So that's a basic foam. And then uh, during the proofing process, which is as the bread is rising, the gas bubbles will expand, and some of them will kind of rupture to form bigger bubbles. Uh, and then during baking, it's kind of like cementing it in place. And um, the matrix ruptures, and all the gas comes out, or, well, is replaced by air, I guess. So. The question I think that a lot of people might have about this is why doesn't the gas, gas just drift up, upward? Why is it, is it held in the, in the dough as it's formed? Um, and the answer is that there is an intricate rigid structure that forms that holds the, the gas in place. And it's amazing because the hole size in these pores, it, it ends up being uniform. So this, this really is a very beautiful process. And so it's facilitated by kneading. Um, kneading serves to mix the ingredients, obviously. And you've probably heard the expression to de develop the gluten. That means nothing to me. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know what, what developing gluten means. So what is gluten? It's basically a protein complex. It's not just a protein. There are starches inside and also some lipids. And basically, it's a mess. <laughs> um, it contains about 75% uh, of the total protein in the, in the wheat seed. And then um, it itself is 75% proteins. But it has a whole bunch of crap in it, as you see there. And uh, it's responsible for the fact that the dough is flexible and elastic. So what is gluten? What is a protein? I know that you guys all learned this in high school. But I'll take a second to look at it. So it comes down to amino acids, which are building blocks that come together to make proteins. Um, amino acids uh, all share the common structure of having an amino group on one side, the carbonyl on the other side, and then an R group at the bottom, which uh, varies depending on what the amino acid is. Here are some of them here, which you probably recognize. Uh, and there are 20 naturally occurring amino acids that will alternate to make different proteins. So they come together, form a peptide bond, and once you amass a whole bunch of them together, you get a peptide. So that was a review of, I don't know, high school, <laughs> high school chemistry and biology. <laughs> OK, and then after you have this like chain, it's going to start folding and bending around itself. And um, there are some other bonds that can form. Because of the fact that there are those side chains hanging off the uh, the amino acids. One of the amino acids, cysteine, has a thiol group, which is sulfur and hydrogen, right here. And uh, cysteine has a tendency to form disulfide linkages, 
which is basically where two sulfides hanging out next to each other will form a bond, a linkage. Um, and so as these disulfide uh, bonds form, you end up with um, a less porous structure. So this is the, the gluten after it's been kneaded for a while. And this is uh, dough that has also been kneaded, but is uh, missing the cysteines. So you can see that it doesn't form the same um, elastic structure that will capture the air. So, Heather? yes? Um, so have people actually taken SEM images of dough? Yes. Wow. Yes, they have. And gluten. But, you know, I, I wasn't aware of this, so I, I've always been interested in, in the science of, of um, dough and baking in general. I guess it's kind of a tendency of being a chemist. I had no idea until I started preparing this Fred talk the volume of, of research that's done in this area. Like, like people are, are still trying to figure out how, how exactly uh, dough rises. So, so it's not stir crazy PhDs with an old pizza crust in the lab. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, they're the PhDs eating the crust in the lab, and they don't know what it is, and we don't either. So, so this, this whole concept of forming these disulfide linkages in order to make the elastic um, gluten structure is, is really still a postulate. Um, and there's a little bit of an issue with that. So, so I'll show you a little bit of data. Basically, these are um, different glutens that were mixed for uh, different amounts of times. Here are the disulfide bonds that uh, were detected in the experiment. And you actually see that the disulfide bonds in the gluten decrease as it's needed. And then also, uh, the number of thiol groups that are available increases. So that almost indicates that the disulfide groups are breaking apart. So in the last 10 years, the whole uh, understanding of gluten has really kind of had an upheaval process. And then this is, a, I, I thought, a very nice picture of um, some uh, of the, the pores not being so uniform, but still really, really beautiful. OK, so here's an alternative um, hypothesis that's been presented. Uh, as to the structure of, of gluten and, and what happens during the kneading process. So these very sophisticated little lines represent the, the peptide backbone in the, um, in the gluten. And the bonds between them are actually hydrogen bonds. Hydrogen bonds are non-covalent bonds. That ha it's a weak interaction, but, um, but it still you know, is, is something. And uh, it wasn't originally suspected to be part of this because of the fact that it's a weak interaction, but Science is filled with surprises. So, so the hydrogen bonds initially are present between the strands. <coughs> then during the kneading process, they actually get kind of broken up, and water comes into these loops. And then the ending structure has, has these loops where the, the adjacent strands are not actually attached to each other, and then has areas where they are attached to each other using hydrogen bonding and the disulfide linkages. It's not like they completely went away. They're still there. Um, and so basically, the idea is that this provides the dough with an elasticity. So when you pull it out, you end up with the strands being pulled out. And when you push it together, you push the loops together, and, and it works. It's not as, uh, um, it's not as inflexible as, as the disulfide linkages would be, because they're very strong bonds that are not going to be interrupted just by pulling and contracting. So um, basically, the process of kneading then incorporates water into the matrix uh, of the gluten and, uh, and facilitates, facilitates this process, which is surprising. And to my chagrin, after all of my interest in this, uh, it turns out that you can make no-knead bread, <laughs> which I found out while, uh, while uh, doing, doing some, some research for this. Basically, the way that this works is you make the dough, but you don't well, you mix all the ingredients together, but you don't need it. And it has a lot more water than, than a typical dough would have. Um, so actually, you can't knead it. <laughs> it's kind of uh, gloopy. Um, but because of the <laughs> very technical terms here, um, because of the fact that there, it has more water um, and you give it more time to rise, it actually kind of does the mixing on its own, just very slowly. Um, so to make this dough, you have to let it rise for 15 to 24 hours, but 
but you don't have to do any kneading. So you can just throw the stuff in a bowl and then let it hang out. And uh, it turns out that it makes really, really great bread that I can't wait to try, actually. So, all right, so that's bread. Now, the chemistry of onions, another interesting topic, um, I think, anyway. I thought I would start off with the chemistry of onions with a uh, cheesy quote. Carl Sandburg is an, an American poet, and um, yeah. <laughs> you can read. It's cheesy. Oh, actually, wait. Also, this, uh, this is a, a Degas painting. I had no idea that he did still lifes of onions, but it's actually amazing. Like, uh, there, there's a, a verse in Numbers from the Bible about onions, and people have been obsessed with them for quite some time. Anyway, the reason why onions are such a big part of, uh, of baking and, well, not baking, sorry, <laughs> of cooking is because of the fact that they have so many flavor compounds. And these flavor compounds come from sulfur, uh, or come from the, uh, the sulfur that is part of them. Um, and normally, sulfur smells terrible. <laughs> Thiol compounds, um, which are compounds that have the uh, sulfur and then the hydrogen attached to, well, whatever else. Um, can be detected by the nose at per per billion levels, and uh, they really stink. So these are things that uh, come from like skunks and uh, the stuff that is put in your gas that you can smell when it's leaking. Um, and they can be tasted at part per million levels in uh, solution. So there's really not very much of them in the onion and the garlic. Um, and, uh, and at low levels, I guess some of them can actually taste good. So, so these are all the sulfur compounds that are part of the onion and uh, part of the garlic. In terms of like the history of this, people started looking at it in the 1800s, and then this was a really interesting finding. Um, intact garlic cloves have no free sulfides. So the things that stink and the things that make you cry are not in the intact garlic clove. It doesn't appear until the garlic clove is cut. And uh, this is one of the, the molecules that I'm going to talk about just a little bit called uh, allicin. So this is in garlic, actually, but garlic, onions, they're all part of the, uh, the same family. Um, and then later on, uh, they found this other compound, which is actually in, um, um, in onions. You don't need to know what all these compounds are. Basically, the important thing is that cysteine, the amino acid I mentioned earlier, um, can be incorporated into a couple of different compounds that are similar in onions and garlic. And then when the onion or garlic gets cut open, a whole cascade of reactions can happen using the enzymes that are part of the, uh, of the cells. And the enzymes, the, the reason why these reactions don't happen when the cell is intact is that the enzymes are in the vacuoles of the cell, which is the balloon where it stores food and water and things like that. So what happens? This is the alanase enzyme that catalyzes the reactions. And this is the thing that's in the vacuoles. So this is the, uh, the sulfur compound that's in the onion. And that's the one that's in the garlic. They interact with this enzyme once the, uh, the, the cell is cut. And then this is vitamin B6. It has to be there in order for it to work. And you get these weird looking things that are volatile. and um, and then in the case of the onion, another enzyme interacts with this species really quickly and makes the lacrimating factor. And so this is the thing that makes you cry. And it's amazing that none of these things are in contact with each other, at least in my opinion, this is amazing. And you cut open an onion and five or 10 seconds later you're crying. And uh, this, all, all, this whole cascade of, of reactions happens so quickly. Um, Okay, and so there's a, a similar uh, reaction that happens with the garlic, but, uh, but this does not lead to any species that will make you cry. This is the, uh, the lacrimal gland in the eye. It's located like <coughs> near eyebrow. I had no idea how this works. Apparently the, the, the tears are made in this gland and then they follow, they follow through the ducts and actually cross your eye in this direction. And then the tear sac, which is here, I thought that's where the tears came from, but that's actually where the tears collect before they drain through your nose. So, uh, so that's how the, the eye works. And uh, the tears are produced in response to the fact that 
this uh, lacrimating factor is, is irritating your eye. These are some goggles that you can purchase <laughs> off, of, uh, off of Amazon for like, I don't know, 20 or $25 uh, in order to prevent onion uh, crying from onions. I, I, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I, you know, I, I, I've, I've heard this. I think that it really varies among people because I wear contacts and I cry like a baby. <laughs> it's, uh, it, it, it's really... <laughs> okay. okay, so <laughs> moving on. So there is a happy story. There is a happy end to all of this, even though it's making the crap that irritates your eyes and you're crying and you need to run out of the room to get away from the onion, which is just an inanimate vegetable. Um, <laughs> these compounds that are made in that whole process have great properties for your body. So uh, this species here, which is, is, uh, is made, um, again, like just in the quick cascade reactions, um, is an anti-thrombotic agent, um, agent, which means that it prevents clotting, so it can help with strokes and heart disease and things like that. So it's also cytotoxic, though, so it's really bad to feed garlic to your pets. For humans, it's not an issue because the cytotoxicity is not as severe. These compounds can also react with uh, free radicals, which are implicated in a lot of different things, including aging and cancer. And the moral of the story, I guess, is that even though they make you cry, onions and garlic make some really good stuff. And, um, and once it gets into the body, it doesn't stay there, which is kind of odd. It actually transforms into something else which is an even better anti-cancer agent. But in order to avoid garlic breath and um, actually apparently even if you rub garlic on your feet, later on you can taste it in your mouth because it gets into your plasma. Some really screwed up things with these molecules because of the fact that you can taste them. Yeah, rubbing my feet, right? Yeah. Because of the fact that you can taste them at part per billion levels, like it's insane. Apparently, uh, when you chew garlic, you, it can remain in your breath for 96 hours, which is yeah, a really long time. <laughs> okay, so, so all of these guys are, are great for you, and um, you can make or, well, have a company make for you an extract where they, they try to get these things out of the garlic without any sort of crying or bad breath or, I don't know, lost relationships. <laughs> so... Uh, that's the end of my tale.